Presenting a global viewpoint on U.S. criminal justice, the Chief Executive of Fair Trials, Jago Russell. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be here. I want to present this morning a global viewpoint on criminal justice in the U.S. Um, Bruce, the previous speaker, lost his first slide. I've definitely stolen some of the data from some of his. You've seen these pictures before. No other country in the world imprisons so many people as the US. No other country in the world burdens so many people with the long-term collateral consequences of conviction. I believe the US is uh, the country in the world that has created a justice system which is more efficient and more inhumane than any other country at criminalizing vast swathes of the population. Um, and that clearly needs to change. Um, I believe a global viewpoint, looking at the US justice system from the outside, can help this great justice reform movement to achieve change. I don't think it offers you a silver bullet solution, but you guys, you all know that fixing these huge problems with the US justice system is incredibly complicated, that there isn't a silver bullet solution. Um, but I think that taking a global viewpoint can help challenge deeply held preconceptions because, like it or not, we all view the world from the seat we're sitting in. I think it can also help identify possible approaches to really difficult, deeply entrenched problems. And as you know, many of the problems in the US justice system are deeply entrenched. Uh, but I also think it can show that there are better ways of doing criminal justice. I'm going to start with plea bargaining. Now, here in the US, in the system, plea bargaining is so pervasive that it can be almost impossible to question the way plea bargaining is done here in the US. But let me tell you, from an outside perspective, the US approach to plea bargaining is incredibly weird. It's odd. <laughs> and from an outside perspective, it's pretty clear that many of these big problems in the justice system in the US derive from the way you rely so heavily on plea bargaining. A couple of examples, pretrial detention. I believe that pretrial detention is used so excessively here in the US because detaining people pretrial is a really great way to soften them up for a guilty plea. <laughs> I mean, people don't talk about that, but I think this question of how do you get people to plead, I think that question is infusing the attitudes and cultures of prosecutors in the United States. Over criminalization, I also think plea bargaining practice in the US is facilitating over criminalization. When I speak about plea bargaining reform here, people say to me, but the justice system here would collapse under the sheer weight of cases if we got rid of plea bargaining. But from an outside perspective, what that shows is that mass criminalization, <laughs> thank you, is, <laughs> is uh, slightly embarrassing, is, is uh, <laughs> at, at least my flies are done up, I think, <laughs> is that mass criminalization, it just wouldn't be possible without plea bargaining US style. I think if we can address how the US does plea bargaining, I think it could have transformative effects across the whole justice system. Oh. OK, going the wrong way. OK. So what can the rest of the world teach us about plea bargaining in the US? Well, over the last 40 years, countries all over the world have started adopting plea bargaining. But they're also really conscious of the dangers of how plea bargaining is done in the United States. And so what they've done is they've put in place really quite robust safeguards to protect against injustice. Let me talk to you about just a couple of those. The first is the trial penalty. So people here are starting to look at the punishment that you get in the US for simply exercising your right to a trial. How much longer the sentence is for people who go to trial? Many other countries in the world have really strict limitations on, on the discount that you get if you plead guilty. So in my country, England and Wales, the maximum discount is one-third of your sentence. Now, to be honest, I'm really scared about this focus in the US just on the trial penalty. 
because I don't want to see the discount reducing. It will just lead to longer prison sentences. But I think what we need to look at in the US is how plea bargaining, the need for a really tough threat so that people plead guilty, is contributing to these crazy inflated sentences that you have. I think that really when it comes to sentencing in the US, the tail is wagging the dog. The, the desire to get people to plead is the thing that's resulting in these crazy rules on sentence enhancements and these crazily long sentences, and the world has huge amounts to offer on fairer sentencing regimes. Let me talk to you about access to counsel. To me, it's shocking that so many people here in the US are pleading guilty to criminal offences when they've not had access to a lawyer. How can you know the strength of the case against you without access to a lawyer? How can you possibly understand the complex collateral consequences of a conviction if you've not spoken to a lawyer? And yet, uh, a, the Commission on Indigent Defense in Michigan found that over half of all people that pleaded guilty at their first hearing in Michigan hadn't seen a lawyer. Now, most other countries in the world, like those shown in black here, but others too, they require a person to have seen a lawyer before a guilty plea is accepted. Some countries think that access to a lawyer is so crucial, so crucial, that they pay for legal assistance, for access to counsel, for every person that pleads guilty, regardless of their financial means. Discovery. I'm so excited about the discovery reforms here in, in New York. The fact that there's going to be pre-plea discovery in criminal cases. It's incredibly exciting to me. Um, many other countries in the world have been doing this kind of thing for a long time. I suspect, I know prosecutors hate discovery, <laughs> hate early discovery. I suspect that there will be big challenges in implementing these rules on early discovery here in New York. And I think that perhaps the US could learn some lessons from the rest of the world about how to overcome some of those challenges. So I think looking at questions like pre-plea discovery is crucial to ensuring the fairness of plea bargaining practice. Transparency. So look, as I said, I was starting, wanted to start with plea bargaining because plea bargaining is how criminal justice is done here in the United States. 97% of, of criminal convictions in the federal system come from plea bargaining. Yet despite the amazing work that's being done here in the US to gather data to understand how the criminal justice system is working, it still seems to me like plea bargaining practice is some kind of black box. People don't really seem to know or to have insight into what's happening in these plea negotiations. And that terrifies me. There was a study that you probably all know uh, by the Vera Institute looking at, uh, looking at a prosecutorial practice in Manhattan which found that uh, black and Latino people uh, were much more likely to be given very punitive plea offers than similarly situated white people. I think that racial inequity is being fed in this black box of plea bargaining practice. I also think, and you hear endless stories about how people are being punished in plea negotiations for exercising their constitutional rights, for making pretrial motions, offers are being withdrawn. I think it's urgently needed in the US to try and shed a light on what's happening in this black box of plea bargaining. I want to turn to another topic now. I think that the US should be focusing more on access to counsel in the police station. I know you've got massive challenges with implementing in Gideon and Wainwright, um, but I think it's crucial to try and get more defendants to have counsel in the police station. And we've been fighting this battle in Europe for the past 10 years. Because 10 years ago, many defendants in Europe didn't get any access to a lawyer, particularly poor defendants, until their first court hearing. But early access to counsel is so crucial. It's crucial to start preparing for bail hearings. It's crucial to start discussions about diverting cases that shouldn't be in the justice system out of the justice system. And it's crucial to try and prevent the kind of coercion that results in unfair guilty pleas. And so now, in Europe, every suspect has the right to consult a lawyer before their police interrogation. Every suspect has the right to have a lawyer with them during the police interrogation. And the police have an obligation to try and help people access counsel. And this, I think, 
learning about the impact of this massive revolution in access to cancer in Europe could provide really interesting, exciting lessons for the United States. And I'd love it if there were ways to work with any of you here in this room to try and find ways to use the data about the transformative impact of early access to counsel in Europe to try and argue for lawyers to be placed in precincts here in the United States. Just very quickly, one final topic. Pre-trial detention. I'm delighted to see so much focus here in the United States on trying to fix the over-reliance on pre-trial detention, trying to tackle uh, the problems with discriminatory cash bail systems, even abolishing cash bail altogether, but also the efforts and investment that is going into trying to kind of improve judicial decision-making by creating new tools to address uh, risk, to understand risk, and crucially, of course, understanding the possible uh, discriminatory impacts of those tools. But if you take a global perspective, the conversation should be and, and needs to be much broader. It can sometimes see and seem in the US like you've got a binary option, you know, either discriminatory cash bail or, or uh, risk assessments. I don't have time to go into them, but some of the things uh, I think is how do you set proportionate cash bail? So in Ireland, cash bail is typically set about $100, <laughs> uh, and you don't pay it unless you fail to turn up to court. Um, looking at taking cases out of the criminal, out of pretrial detention altogether. So in Italy, uh, a law was changed which, which reduced the pretrial population by a third. And it simply said, if you couldn't get more than a five-year sentence, you can't be detained pretrial. And that had a huge impact and due process protections earlier in criminal proceedings. So I said earlier, prosecutors hate discovery. We were involved in legal changes in Europe, which mean that if a prosecutor is now asking for detention, that they need to provide discovery to the defense so that the defense can prepare for the bail hearing. And in one country, in Hungary, that resulted in a one-third reduction in the number of requests uh, for detention by prosecutors, because they just didn't want to hand over the evidence. So we're at the beginning of this process of trying to understand how we can help the US reform movement, you people in this room, to access this global viewpoint to try and enrich your work. I said at the beginning of my talk, and I'm coming to a close now, I said at the beginning of my talk that the US is a global outlier, and you all know the shocking statistics on that. But there's another way that people often overlook in which the US is a global outlier. I'm really lucky in my job to work with amazing justice reformers all over the world. But let me tell you, there is no other country in the world which has such an amazing movement for justice reform. It really is truly inspiring to see what's going on here in the United States. Um, at fair trials, we know from global experience that there are better ways of doing criminal justice. And simply, we just want to help you find those ways. Thank you.